this video is going to be part one of a project that I'm starting. And basically this is going to be sort of like a book review, but rather than just review, I'm going to be going through each of the various arguments that this guy makes in this book and seeing if what he has to say is valid or not. Um, the name of this book is All That's Wrong with the Bible, Contradictions, Absurdities, and More. It's written by a guy named Jonah David Connor, who's a former Christian, a Ph.D., and he apparently details a little bit about his own experience and presents what he believes are contradictions in the Bible and various absurdities and other things. I haven't read this whole thing yet, uh, but my plan is to go through it and take each contradiction one at a time and probably make a video about each one to see why he thinks it's a contradiction, if that is a required conclusion, and see if there are other ways that make good sense to think about it. He talks about in the beginning of the book, in the introduction, about ideas about inerrancy and what qualifies as a contradiction and makes the case that some Christians will go to extreme lengths to avoid categorizing anything that's in the Bible as a contradiction. And I can appreciate that he would think this, and maybe he's right. But it, we each had to make up our minds what we're going to think about the origin of the universe, why we're here, and if there's a God or not. And I made another video a while back comparing the five different views of reality in terms of the different origin stories. And not that there are only five views, but the five categories of views that, from what I can tell, there are no more categories than those five, uh, and that every perspective fits into one of them. And if you know one beyond uh, the categories I've listed, please let me know. I would certainly like to know that. Um, but in that video and in some other ones that I made on the same topic, I talked about the idea that there's a whole lot that we don't know and that none of these perspectives can be proven in a way that is unassailable to logic. You know, it's the amount of data that we have available to us is limited. So if we're going to be objective and try to make a right decision about how to live based on what is or isn't true, then we're going to have to look at the data and try to sort out what we think is real, what we think is true, what makes sense based on what knowledge we have access to. And so I'm going to try not to assume that I'm right as I'm going through all this, but rather, depending on the context of what he's talking about, I'm going to try to uh, take a reasonable approach and be charitable uh, in the way that I would interpret what he's saying and be charitable in the way that I would interpret what the Bible is saying. So I would prefer to not attribute to him a uh, contradiction in the things that he's saying and interpret him charitably in the same way I would like to read the Bible or any other uh, religious book uh, with the expectation that the writers of it are not going to contradict themselves or the other writers that they're purporting to agree with and that if there's some way that is reasonable to conclude that they're saying something that is consistent internally, then to at least consider that as a possibility. And whether we should believe that these texts are true and that they accurately reflect what is true about reality and that they're telling us the right story about who God is or if there's a God, then that's kind of a separate question from how we should understand each of these religious texts to be internally consistent or not. And if we're going to give these religious texts a honest look, then we should, I think, basically I just think that we should approach each of these religious texts and try to be reasonable in the way that we're thinking about it. And if we're going to impose modern precision onto an ancient text that maybe doesn't intend to convey all the things that we wanted to convey, then that might be an unreasonable way to approach it. We should try to read these things in the way that they were intended to be read or understood without imposing too many external criteria that 
the text didn't impose on itself and to try to read it in harmony with itself in a way that makes sense. And it's just reasonable. I guess that's what I'm saying, is I'm trying to take a reasonable approach to understand whatever people are saying and trying to catch them in any kind of thing that they might have said that is could be taken in two different ways and say, oh, this is a contradiction when it could be interpreted in a way that is consistent with itself. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And I just wanted to take this um, occasion to talk about that. And so um, first I'm going to talk a little bit about his ideas about what amounts to a contradiction. And I think that some of these are a little bit too simplistic. And because they're not precise enough statements he's using, even in his examples, to produce a uh, true contradiction. And so the one he has here is the example is John is short and John is not short. Or those are qualitative statements. And it doesn't specify that it's the same John. You know, so if you're going to presuppose that it's the same John and that short is has a precise definition and that the same John both meets and does not meet that same uh, definition, then that would certainly be a contradiction. But if you don't specify which John and you don't specify what qualifies as short, then saying that he is short, that John is short and John is not short, doesn't necessarily amount to a contradiction. Uh, similarly, where it says here, John went to the park and John did not go to the park. Well, again, it's not talking about, it doesn't specify which John, it doesn't specify when. You know, if, if one statement is that John went to the park and the other statement is John did not go to the park ever in time, well, then that would be uh, clear enough if you're talking about the same John. But if one person was saying John went to the park on Tuesday and the other person is talking about John did not go to the park on Wednesday, then that would not be a contradiction. Before we declare something in the Bible to be a contradiction, we need to be sure that we're not inferring things that the Bible itself doesn't say. So that's one thing. And the second thing, he talks about um, a different type of contradiction, which is when you have incompatible concepts. And the example he gives is John is ugly and John is handsome. Well, again, you could be talking about two different Johns. And also, this is another qualitative statement, ugly versus handsome. So by what criteria are we saying uh, something is ugly or handsome? You know, one person might think that something is beautiful while the other person thinks it's hideous, you know. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, they say. And so I'm just making the case that if it's a qualitative statement, then we need to consider the possibility that there's degrees of something. Now, this second one is a better example. And if it, we're assuming that it's the same John and that he was at the park at 7 p.m. today and was at the grocery store at 7 p.m. today, well, that would apparently be a contradiction because unless the grocery store is in the park, you know, then that would appear to be two different places. Uh, but again, it's a tense statement. You know, so, I mean, 7 p.m. today, well, where at 7 p.m.? You might say John was at the park at 7 p.m. today in Birmingham and that he was at uh, a grocery store at 7 p.m. today in Villa Rica, Georgia. I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying that uh, those are two different locations in two different time zones. And so it's possible that both could be true, uh, but we're talking about some other uh, point about time. You know, so if we're going to attribute a contradiction to the writers of Scripture, then I think we need to consider the precision with which they are speaking. And so the author of this book might think that taking this kind of approach is unreasonable, but I'm just making the case that I think that's a way to read the Bible charitably, to not attribute contradictions to the writers unless that's the only way to understand what they're saying. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense, and I will start this project soon and talk about the first example in the book. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe if you'd like to hear more about this project as I go through it. God bless you.